now history. I don't want to go into that. And as uh, Mohan said, I've already spoken about it a couple of years back, uh, maybe in the same room. Uh, so, but of late, what uh, many of you would, I'm sure, have heard about is this particular education uh, on which it was awarding from the existing three-year to the four-year uh, kind of program. So uh, there was a lot of you know, various groups which started protesting and a uh, lot of voices were raised against this. M much of which, yeah, much of which actually uh, has been reported. But I thought what was what took off really late, late in the sense because the the academic council uh, of uh, Delhi University passed the the structure of this program in 2012 December, uh, and uh, ever since that there were protests um, in teacher groups. Uh, Duta, the Delhi University Teachers Association, was protesting. Uh, student groups, basically left student uh, groups, uh, ISA. Uh, SFI and many other groups were also protesting, whereas the, mm, the so-called major players in student politics in Delhi University like um, uh, NSU and uh, ABVP were like uh, kind of either reticent on this or uh, uh, NSU at least uh, because of maybe the Congress pr uh, pressure, uh, you would hear one or two other, some leaders making odd, uh, what do you call statements in favor of the new reform, whereas AB, from ABVP we had like conflicting kinds of uh, views. For instance, uh, the Delhi state president uh, gave a public statement uh, saying that uh, this is a very good reform. Uh, and uh, within a week you have uh, somebody like uh, Arun Jaitley saying, no, no, this is very problematic, uh, you know, university should not do this kind of thing. So. Yeah, I don't want to sketch the entire history of the movement, but what I want to focus on here is when we were kind of, you know, struggling against the implementation of this program, uh, the struggle went on in form of uh, recording dissents in statutory meetings. Even that was actually very problematic because uh, quite often in statutory meetings uh, like academic council or uh, committees of courses and all, uh, the chair would say that, no, no, we will not allow dissent. You cannot give dissent. And it, you had to like struggle to say that, no, no, please record. You pass it, but then you at least note on record that, uh, you know, such and such members oppose this. Uh, so apart from that kind of uh, action, we also took struggle outside, uh, groups were meeting public and we also met a uh, large number of political leaders, leaders in the opposition, leaders of various political groups, ministers. And when we uh, started talking to ministers, I mean, uh, the Minister of State for HRD, Shashi Tharoor, uh, said, I mean, uh, see, look here, we don't intervene in this. I mean, uh, we don't want to intervene in this because we respect the autonomy of the university. Uh, so this was his argument. He said, uh, tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, if, if the ministry intervenes in something else, you yourself will come and say that, how can you intervene in the university? University is autonomous. So we respect the autonomy of the university and we don't intervene in this. So this, I thought, was a you know, paradoxical situation because here you have a group of teachers uh, no, group in the sense, not a small group, right? Actually, it is the majority. Although uh, the major it is the, clearly the majority because uh, if you look at uh, referendum con conducted by student groups, uh, it turned out that 90 percentage of student from around 15,000 students voted, participated in the referendum, and in that 90 percentage of students opposed the reform even after it was implemented. And these were students who are actually doing the course, not like any student comes and opposes it. Students who have done this course for two years, three, two months now, say that this is a meaningless course, please save us from this. And they were opposing it. So, and in teacher, uh, Duta general body, uh, in a gathering of 800, 900 teachers, uh, uh, unanimously it was rejected. So here we have, you know, large number of students, large number of uh, teachers going to the ministry and saying that, please stop this, please do something. 
please save us from this. And the ministry is saying, no, we will not do anything because we respect your autonomy. So this I thought is like, you know, actually it, it should have been for the teachers and students to fight for autonomy and ministry and we would have expected the ministers to, you know, try uh, to find a way into like coming, uh, what do you call breaking that autonomy and in, what do you call imposing their uh, agenda. But here we had a kind of reverse situation. Teachers and students from the university are saying, no, please uh, do something. And minister is saying, no, no, we will not do something because we respect your autonomy. Now, this set us thinking, so uh, how come we, you know, we encounter this paradox? And it, does, it didn't take like, much thinking because it's very evident why it appears as a paradox. Because it's only a paradox at the most superficial level. Because what, is hap what was happening was very clearly, here was a university, a vice chancellor, using statutory bodies, using statutory bodies like academic council and executive council, implementing a kind of program which actually comes in a veiled way, manner, as uh, the agenda of the ministry. So it's actually that the, vice the ministry has succeeded in getting the vice chancellor to implement its program. And so now this looks like you know, the university is doing it on its own. Whereas every, everyone in the university knows that it is not the university is doing on its own. It is, it is very clear that uh, when the current vice chancellor was uh, appointed, I mean, we've got uh, reliable information. He was number third in the panel, which was shortlisted. Uh, and uh, it seems the first two uh, people were called and they were given the, the, this particular mandate that you take over this vice chancellorship and you implement these programs. And uh, it seems they said, no, no, we can't do it like that because you know, this, it, it will be a very under, undemocratic way of doing things. And uh, this, this particular, the third person who was the th number three, the incumbent vice chancellor, accepted that. And that was, so it, here you have, you get a, the right kind of vice chancellor, the right kind of person, not, I shouldn't say the right kind of vice chancellor, the right kind of person to sit on that uh, chair to implement the program and who can actually uh, suppress all kinds of voices, who can actually get people who will be most affected, most discriminated by this program to come outwardly supporting this. Because uh, when we were mobilizing a large number of SCST OBC teachers against this program, because it, it you know, you just have to look at the structure of the program uh, and you will realize how discriminatory it can be. It even provides for what's called early exits. So uh, it's a four-year program. So if you, for some reason, cannot study for four years, after two years, you can exit. You, after two years, you exit with a diploma. After three years, you exit with, a, with an, what's called an ordinary bachelor's degree. After four years, you exit with an honors degree. And you should remember that currently, do you, currently in the sense, till last year, do you used to award uh, both honors degree and the what's called the past degree as, as three-year programs. So replacing that, now you have a three-tier system of diploma, uh, bachelors, and honors. And we said what is missing is actually one more layer, right? I mean, we should have had actually four layers, which would, which would reflect our social reality. So for some reason, uh, they have, you know, uh, instead of the four-tier caste system, they have implemented a three-caste system of degrees or diplomas. Diploma, degree, honors. And it's like, uh, whenever we raise this, people say, no, no, you are uh, like, you know, just uh, hypothesizing, how can you be sure? But we can be sure that we know which kind of people will exit after two years. If you come from a family which can afford your education for four years, I mean, unless you have some reason, like strange personal reasons, you will for no, I mean, there will be no compelling reason for you to drop out. Unless, uh, uh, like, personal reasons, like, uh, imagine you, are, you become a drug addict and you drop out after two years. That could be one possibility. Otherwise, I can't think of anyone who will decide to leave after two years. Who are the people who will leave after two years? That will reflect our social stratum. The people exiting with diplomas will be large number of SCST, OBC students. And people graduating with honors will be large number of non-SC, non-ST, non-OBC students, and very few numbers. So it will build a pyramid 
like this, where you have SCST, OBC with diplomas, and then less fewer number at de uh, degree, and very few number at honors. And for the other, uh, for the unreserved category, it will be the opposite. You will have it something like this. So we thought one of the reasons w which we believe in is that education can, to some extent, function as a social uh, you know, leveler. It, it should. I mean, that, that's the reason why like, even uh, any poor family would want their children to study. Uh, because and they are ready to sacrifice for it because they think that this will you know, give some kind of equalizing uh, effect. Whereas this program, we said, will take away that. It, it will straight, you don't have to do anything automatically. By, and uh, when we talked to the minister, when we talked to vice chancellor, everyone said, but we are not forcing anyone to go out. It's optional. See, people are dropping out anyway. So they, instead of dropping out, let them go out with a diploma. That's all we are saying. But then it's very clear to us, and in uh, several meetings, in colleges, for instance, when teachers ask principals, uh, like, why do we have this diploma? I mean, who will exit from the diploma? Then they will say, no, these students from those bastis, you know, which are nearby, they will they can go with a diploma, like why should they you know, study four years and uh, struggle? It will be easy for them. So that means if you are from a Basti, then you will go with this diploma and you will you know, end up, and what kind of job will you get? Whereas if you come from a well-to-do family, then you go with an honors degree and you can climb up. So this means it, cement, it cements the social inequality. So this was the large, this, this and this I thought was the strongest critique of the FYUP. FIUP, by the way, is the, uh, the university itself coined this particular, uh, uh, what do you call, short form, FYUP. Later, they, uh, I think in the very recent document, they thought that FYUP may, like, you know, uh, I think people were making fun of it in some sense. So they, instead of F, they made it uh, 4. And then now they, in the official documents, they write 4YUP. So, I mean, for the numeral 4, right? So, uh, anyway, now this, uh, so the, uh, the particular point that I was trying to say is, now you have a public funded university introduce a program, right? Introduce a program which will actually negate, go against all the social affirmative actions which is pub again sponsored by the state. Right, so using public money. The public money goes into reservation and all these policies. Right, so so you have on the one hand the state, you know, spending for reservation, you know, for social upliftment, and then what you do is you get a public funded university to devise a program which will dismantle the entire thing, which means the what you admit people through reservation, but then you also give them early exit. Right? And then you go to the, in the honors class, if you go, it will be like the pre-reservation days, where you will, the, the caste composition will be like that. So that means you are actually, it's, it's almost like you're taking away something which you are giving, right? But then the paradox here again is that what is given is like, you know, through proper legislation, through what you call all procedures are followed, the constitutionally uh, given procedures, whereas when you look at this four-year program, because the, basically the four-year program goes against the education policy which government of India approved uh, following the Kothari Commission. The three-year degree was approved by the parliament. Now, you have a parliament-approved policy, which is a nationwide policy. And now you are making a university, one central university, and by the way, not a very small, I mean, I think uh, maybe the second biggest central university, and uh, in terms of uh, visibility and all so-called, I mean, the foremost uh, central university, uh, adopt something which is against that national policy. And our uh, attack was this. We said, if you want to change the education policy, please do it properly. You have a debate in the parliament. Let there be you know, consensus on this. Let uh, prominent educationalists and actually not just educationalists, people from all walks of life because education concerns everyone, right? It's not just for educationalists to de decide what education should be. Every, every uh, citizen has a kind of stake in it. So that way, let all of us sit together and devise a na nationwide policy. And if we are convinced that a four-year degree is better than or a four-year degree is the need of, this, of the hour, let us do it. 
But instead of that, what the government is doing is doing it in a clandestine manner. Getting the kind of people who occupy this kind of executive positions. So what has to what should have been done through you know proper legislative action is now being done through executive action, which goes against the spirit of democracy. Democracy, as you know, is not I mean the executive cannot frame policies, right? But whereas that is being done. That is being done in education, in the four year program, and it is also once we touched this four year program. Then we realized what kind of, because all of us were asking, how can, you know, it was like almost the entire nation is against it. You had uh, prominent intellectuals, uh, uh, politicians, you had the opposition leader, you had um, even uh, ministers or uh, leaders from Congress itself, like uh, Jairam Ramesh spoke against it, uh, some other minister also, uh, Rashid Latif, another uh, prominent MP. Uh, in Congress, he also wrote. They wrote to the not just speaking in public meetings. They write letters to the Prime Minister saying, "Please review this. I mean, see, just look at what is happening in Delhi University. Please, uh, you know, uh, do something about it." And the Prime Minister will uh, forward all this to the HRD, and the HRD will say, "No, this is. We have checked everything. Everything is according to procedure. This is university autonomy. A university has the uh, what you call power to uh, implement whatever uh, you know." The which actually is wrong. The university has the power to devise courses and curriculum. It doesn't have the power to decide on education policy. The university can, one university cannot decide that, okay, we want to run, because we said tomorrow there are 600 universities in our country. Tomorrow another vice chancellor will say, oh, I will introduce all six year degrees uh, or five and a half degree. All uh, professional education is five year. So let us also make degree five year. Some other vice chancellor will do that. And then you will have one, some universities with three years, some universities four years, another set of universities with five years. And soon we will have a chaotic system. And a nation like ours, a country like India, cannot afford, no country can afford this kind of chaos. There should be uniform educational policy. And 10 plus 2 plus 3 is, uniform, is approved by the parliament. So if you want to change it, you change it, but you change it properly. And the government was not willing to do this. And the reason, this is where, I mean, I'll, I'll, let me come back to that particular issue. So what the, this particular paradox of where the people who want, who should have argued for autonomy, asking for intervention, and people who would have loved to intervene, saying that, no, 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 we respect your autonomy, that comes through this clandestine manner in which uh, an elected government is Introducing anti-people policy. I would, let me say that it is anti-people because the government does not have the face to uh, present these bills in the parliament. Uh, and I'm sure all of you know that. Like when the former education minister Kapil Sibyl tried two times to pass the education bill, six education bills which were pending, and both times there was severe opposition from standing committee of HRD, which is dominated by Congress people. They, but it, because it's very clear who will you know, suffer because of this, these kinds of policies. So the, all this anti-people policy was not possible to be passed through the parliament. And what has been done is, and this again we have information from, in one of the uh, meetings, the, uh, minister, the secretary, uh, higher education secretary is supposed to have said that uh, uh, in a m meeting which involved foreign stakeholders, I mean foreign, because all this, FI, including FIUP, is actually to, uh, uh, what do you call, enhance this, uh, what, uh, or ease the entry of foreign universities, because foreign universities will come with four-year program, and if they come with four-year program and set up their markets here, uh, f people will think before uh, they go there, right? They will think, okay, I, I go to an Indian university and I get three-year degree, why should I go pay more and spend more time and get uh, the same degree? Whereas if you have a four-year degree here and a four-year degree there, then like certain things are equal, right? So they wanted to create a kind of level playing field. And this was one of the major reasons. And th this was said in the, uh, in this meeting, the higher education secretary is supposed to have, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, assured the stakeholders saying that uh, uh, we have not been able to pass this through the parliament, but then we are actually finding other ways to do this. And this will be done. And this will be done in the form of these kinds of 
act through like FIUP. And also, there are other schemes. I mean, the MHRD has already uh, made uh, device schemes to open higher education. So higher education is now going to be a kind of open market, where uh, from next year onwards, perhaps, maybe we will have like large number of private uh, players coming in and setting up universities. And setting up universities not for technical. Like till now, we have had universities uh, offering technical education. But s soon, we, they will have, uh, you know, they will invade the liberal arts and humanities also. So you will have uh, these kinds of universities setting up. Uh, and once we have these private universities, we know what, who is going to suffer, because who will be able to go, uh, f go to these private universities? And also, uh, there has been no uh, word about to what extent will these private universities uh, uh, you know, respect uh, constitutional mandates like reservation. For instance, uh, there is a, a Delhi High Court judgment by Justice Sudarshan Reddy, who very clearly said that uh, the private education uh, institution is a misnomer. He said there is nothing like private. Every, pri every private education or every, ma every education institution which is managed by some private body gets large amount of subsidy, state subsidy. So there is state money going into every educational institution. So no institution can say, no, no, we are completely you know, autonomous or we are completely, we don't get any funding because they do get subsidies, including in land and all, all aspects. So, if these kinds of universities come, then who is going to suffer? It will be, again, the, the marginalized sections of the society. It will be the SCs and STs and OBCs and the poor people who will, be, who will find it difficult to go to the private universities. So then, eventually, what the, our worst fear is that soon we will have that the public educational institutions uh, will become like our government hospitals. Think, look at what happened to the government hospitals. So that a government hospital is something, somewhere, something which only if you do not have the money, right? Even if you don't have money, actually, you would not want to go to a government hospital, right? I mean, you will find somehow borrow money or uh, you know pledge things and somehow go because you know that if you go to a government hospital, you don't get proper treatment. Like uh, you don't. So the same we fear is going to happen to public funded educations because. Only such people will come to these kinds of, and these are these will be the places. So basically, you will have the public-funded universities will be the bastion of the reserved categories. You will have reservation there, and all SCs, ST, OBC will go there. Whereas in private uh, universities, no, no reservation. The moneyed people will go there, and whoever can afford it from the other communities also will go there. So this is where I think the current education reform is. Uh, leading us. And actually, if you think that I'm like trying to paint a dark picture, I mean, uh, you just have to follow the news items which appear date on, on almost uh, a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which was you know, uh, attended by uh, the um, Ambani's and Birla's and all, and where government says that we are going to you know, give uh, 900 cro 900, uh, how much was it, 9,100 crore or something. I can't even uh, con I mean, conceptualize that uh, figure. Government is going to subsidize, use that money to enable these universities to set up. Private universities will set up their shops, and then they will decide everything. They can decide they have full autonomy, because otherwise they will not want to. If, if, they, if you tell them that, no, no, you please implement a uh, reservation, then they will say, no, no, we will not do it. So you have to you know, uh, allure them into doing this. They can fix their fee. They can charge whatever fee they want, and this is going to happen. This news item came like two months back, and uh, recently there was again this uh, another uh, this uh, RUSA, which I was talking about, this uh, Rashtriya Uchitar Shiksha Abhyan. Uh, this is a new scheme which the HRD is floating, which if you read it, it looks like it talks about access to education, equity, and you know all this you know the kind of right sounding words. But then you will, if you look go through the provisions uh, very carefully, you will see that some somehow. Somewhere it opens up all these fields. It basically allows for opening up of education. And um, the minister, again, Shashi Tharoor, uh, made no bones about it in, in one of the responses. Actually, we had uh, engaged with him in, uh, he, I mean, uh, Shashi Tharoor had written a, a note on this particular FYUP saying that, uh, that we respect autonomy and all that. And then uh, along with uh, Dr. Udit Raj and uh, myself, I had, uh, we had written a response to it. And then uh, Shashi Tharoor actually uh, uh, said this. Uh, uh, I mean, 
uh, I forget the exact uh, what he said, but then uh, the yeah, uh, yeah, actually, what he said was that education is the only field which is untouched by reform, and we are going to reform it. This is what he said. So just like we have opened, this is his exact words, actually. Education has been, educate, the field of education has been so far untouched by reform, and we are in the process of reform, reforming it. And we know what, what the reform means. It is opening it up, and it is you know, inviting these players. And then basically it means uh, the so-called, I mean, I'm not saying that the central universities and the state universities are like great places. We, we, are, we are actually in the process of, uh, struggling to democratize these spaces, right? Universities like uh, Delhi University, for instance, it has such a bad uh, track record of uh, implementation of reservation that uh, reservation for SCS and STs in teaching positions, which is there like from 1952 or uh, so, was implemented in Delhi University in 1997. Uh, so after repeated, you know, uh, representations and uh, warnings by the government and so on, uh, I mean, every time you will be surprised. The government writes to the vice chancellor, and the vice chancellor, uh, you know, doesn't do anything. So it's it's very clear. How can the vice chancellor disobey the government? I mean, you have to have like you have to be assured of that immunity, right? You you know that nothing will happen to you because your bosses also they will just make these noises. You know, they will say that no, no, we we are for social justice, we are implementing reservation, but then do nothing and say all that and do nothing. And this was the policy. So in 1997 was the year in which. Uh, uh, SCST reservation was implemented. And OBC reservation, which actually central government uh, approved uh, after the uh, Mandal uh, judgment, after Indira Sani judgment, it was in 1993, the, uh, the revised uh, guideline went uh, to all central uh, uh, government officers saying that please implement OBC reservation. But it was only in the year 2007 that uh, Delhi University implemented OBC reservation. So these universities, all these had like such bad track record. And if on paper, like 49.5 percentage of uh, posts should have been occupied by SCST OBC teachers. Uh, so 27 percentage in uh, Delhi University might be something like you take all the colleges, 80 colleges together, it should be. I, mean, I don't know, by any rough estimate, it should be around 2,000 to 2,500. But uh, I'll be surprised if mo there are more than like 250 teachers, OBC teachers, appointed in Delhi University so far. So it is like one-tenth of the required uh, percentage, even now. So now, but uh, over the last few years, because if, once these 250 teachers come in, then they won't keep quiet, right? Not everyone, but a good number of them also start raising. They will, many of them are socially committed, so they will start, they will, you know, uh, demand for more and more reservation and not more and more reservation, but strict implementation of proper reservation. So right when we are kind of in the process of democratizing these educational institutions, what the state does is, it's, it's actually doing two things. On the one hand, it kind of draw, withdraws itself. It's opening up the field of education. And it will say that, oh, the days of state-funded public education is over. Now we want the PPP model, uh, the public-private, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, yeah, uh, model. And the also completely private model. So these are the, so the state, on the one hand, it's withdrawing. And why is it withdrawing? When you have more and more demand, when, when you have more and more uh, you know, representation of these kinds of communities, you will find that the state somehow it's kind of now not so much interested in investing in uh, education in public uh, funded institutions, but is looking at other areas. That's one kind of thing. But here again, you will see that there is yet Another paradoxical situation. I talked about one paradox uh, earlier, where the, in the context of craving for autonomy, and you know, where it is like a reverse situation, right? The this here, you will think that okay, the state is completely withdrawing from uh, public education. But if you look at it, there is also another aspect to it. Wherever the state has a kind of uh, stake in the education or in education institutions run by the state, you will find that the state is the stronghold of the state is increasing day by day in the sense that there is more and more control. 
there, are, there is more and more vigilance. If you look at uh, institutions, and uh, people here know uh, very well about this, right? So every uh, activity in uh, universities and you know, uh, these kinds of institutes are kind of closely monitored by the state. So you will have uh, intelligence a uh, agents sitting in, I'm sure, in this room itself, right? In any room, it's, it's impossible to hold a public program any meeting, uh, unless it's an academic conference. Uh, I don't know, maybe they infiltrate there also. But then if you say any public program, then you will find uh, either police in uniform and also in mufti. And in the recently, uh, in the most recently concluded uh, protest on FYUP, which was organized by some left groups, it seems they were like, uh, we could identify uh, people from the IB. People from the IB because they come and monitor all activities, and it's very clear. Earlier, they they never used to come to you know if there is anything uh, on strictly on education, you would not find them. But then any kind of political meeting, anything to uh, relating to you know uh, the war on people or anything relating to terrorism, all these meetings you call, and then immediately you will find these people. So uh, recently, even in the protest meeting against FIUP, they were there. So everything is like monitored by the state. And the state either, again, does not do it like directly. The state gets the right, the right kind of people to sit in positions like you know, the vice chancellorship is given to people who will actually you know, uh, obey these kinds of things that dictates, like you should uh, videograph all the uh, protest meetings. And this happened. This is happening in EFL, EFL, I mean, only recently. But in Delhi University, it's been happening uh, for ages. Earlier, it used to be the vice chancellor. But now we will, uh, it, it's done by the police. Their people will come and uh, videograph all the uh, protest meetings. So, so again, the paradoxical situation here is that on the one hand, it looks like state is like, you know, spending less and less, but con trying to control more and more. So this, in order to understand or in order to circumvent this, the only kind of way, the process is, I think, to struggle for democratization. And actually, that is what basically I want to talk about. That is the process of democratizing education. The process of democratiz democratizing education is actually, there are v various uh, uh, fronts which are fighting for this. There is a big protest uh, on uh, October 21st in Delhi. This is organized by this uh, All India Forum for Right to Education. I think uh, Professor Anil Sadgobal, he's going to speak tomorrow, so he will be talking about uh, uh, that. So, and we are also, uh, we have a body called the Joint uh, Action Forum for Democratic Education. Uh, we are also part of this uh, kind of the larger, because this is actually a forum where uh, uh, a meeting where a lot of uh, groups working for this will come together. So uh, democratization in their definition is like uh, from UG to, uh, so, sorry, so from K KG to PG, that's what they say, from KG to PG equal uh, education, accessible education for all. Uh, basically, it, which means that you should not have different school systems, you should have the same, everyone should have equal access to education. And this is the, this is the biggest challenge in front of us. This is what we should be striving for. And on the place of it, what we find, what the, the government policies are trying to do is to bring in more and more uh, differential and discriminatory kind of, now you'll have discriminatory like uh, education universities also. So uh, the, the so-called uh, prestigious uh, private universities and foreign universities which are going to be set up. So that will all encourage. So then you will be discriminated. Like right now you are, you have a problem like if you come to a college, whether you come from a government school or from a private school, right? So similarly, uh, for I mean, a few years afterwards, it will be like whether you come from a, you know, one of those universities or from a state funded universities. So a state funded university, then you will be, you will be, uh, you will have like, uh, you'll be like a second class citizen, right? So. The, to resist this, what one needs is a struggle for more and more representation. Representation is definitely needed. Representation in not just in terms of uh, admission. Of course, admission is important. It should be admission. In terms of employment, in terms of employment, as I was saying, uh, look at the, uh, you know, uh, ratio of uh, SCST OBC teachers in central universities. Uh, like, uh, 
Delhi University till today has not appointed a single SCST OBC uh, person as a professor or associate professor in reservation. Okay, there are few people who have uh, got become professors uh, on so-called general merit, right? But that's not what the government policy says, right? That's not what the constitution says. The UGC 2006 guidelines very clearly say that implement reservation is applicable to all positions. Right? And uh, Delhi University, right now, on paper, they have said they will implement. But even when they implement it, this is what actually we are, our next uh, struggle is on that, the 2006 guidelines. Uh, right now, Delhi University has decided to implement uh, uh, reservation for associate professor and professor for SCST. But then, with a clear guideline saying that we will calculate position from September 2013. That means all the, there is no question of backlog or shortfall. Whatever the existing position, when they fall vacant, we will fill up. Which means the required percentage of 15% per percentage and 7.5% percentage will be attained only after 35 years. And by that 35 years, because somebody who is appointed last five years back will retire only then. Only then that post will go to the NSC uh, or an ST person. Right? And with, with re regard to OBC reservation, uh, very few central universities, I think one or two central universities, not even EFLU, has uh, recognized that OBC reservation has to be implemented for associateship and professorship. Because this is very clear. I mean, there is nowhere it is said that professorship and associate professorship is exempt from OBC reservation. Because the 2006 guidelines, again, if you read it carefully, it is very clear. It says reservation is applicable in all direct recruitment, right? And reservation is what? Reserva there is only one reservation, SC, ST, OBC. There is no two, three types of reservation. The difference is only in terms of percentage. Apart from that, all in all aspects, they are same. So SC, ST, OBC reservation has to be implemented in associate professorship and professorship. Uh, I think Central University of Kerala, at least they advertised. They haven't made any appointment as yet. We are actually, uh, have, we have filed RTI, although we are a bit uh, wary about it because we thought the moment our RT RTI reaches there, they will realize that, oh, actually we are making a mistake. So they, they might cancel the advertisement also. But now, uh, but we realize uh, since uh, it's like pressing because Delhi University will soon start the uh, recruitment of around 4,000 positions. So, so we have to actually you know, get it implemented now. So representation in admission, recruitment, and something which has not been talked about at all is actually rec representation in the so-called officers of the university. There are 40 central universities. Why is that how many of them have SCST or OBC vice chancellors? or other officers. Even in universities which are established in tribal, uh, so-called tribal universities, right? you will find that uh, half, more than, large, very f short, uh, what do you call, uh, minuscule percentage of uh, representation will be given to tribals. So you will find that there are large number of tribals as chaukidars and drivers and all that, but then not in the higher positions. So, Basically, and the, uh, let us also uh, bear in mind that the MHRD is in the process of drafting a bill for, to cover all 40 central universities. They are in the process of doing that. Uh, there, are, there is some opposition from uh, like the minority education institutions because they say they don't want to become part of that. Um, but uh, other universities may soon come under uh, this one uh, because now, uh, it's so almost each university has a, its own uh, bill. Like if, if EFLU, as you know, has a, an act of parliament, Delhi University is established by another act. Uh, and uh, the 2009 uh, act covers some 10 or 12 uh, universities which were established recently. So, but the university, and because of that, what happens is, you know, there is so much of disparity. So the rules are, and regulations are so different from one central university to another. So uh, MHRD is in the process of drafting this. And uh, I think it is time that this act should include this demand that, I mean, not demand, this act should include this provision. We should make that demand. The act should include the provision that, uh, I mean, it's not to say that it, sh it should be 15 percentage of the vice chancellor should be SC and 7.5 and so on, but at the, policy should be that there should be adequate number of representation. And government has every, I mean, because there is not a single uh, sentence said about that right now. The, when a vice chancellor is appointed, when officers of university, when the vice chancellor in turn appoints officers, right, there should be the principle of representation, should be 
kept in mind. And this representation that way is actually the first step for democratization. So that is where, I mean, I thought the democra democratizing education does not I mean, one has to understand, you know, the kind of full ambit of the word. What what does democracy mean here? Democracy means access to everyone, right? Equal education for everyone, A access to, and also representation, representation in all kinds of uh, in offices of the university. So this should be actually uh, state universities do that in some uh, veiled manner, right? So, for instance, in the state where I come from, it's like one, one university is given to the Nair community, the other university is given to the Christian, and the other university is given to a Muslim. Somewhere, I mean, this, the, the state government tries to maintain this. There is no official policy, but then if you look at vice chancellors that have been appointed, it will be always, I mean, some kind of balance will be made like that. But in central university, because central government, you know, does not have to cater to one particular social composition. It is like spread over, you know, such a wide geographic area. And uh, it's it's very, uh, you know, hardly imaginable that these people will actually come together and demand for, you know, we want a, a, a what you call, a vice chancellor from our community or anything like that. Uh, so, but I think this, in this act we should have this provision, uh, which actually is not like widely made. We have been making this uh, demand, but then I think uh, it should come not just from like Delhi; it should come from all places, right? From EFLU also. Your, I mean, Damsa should maybe uh, you know uh, write this. I mean, you, if you if you go to the HRD website, you will find many of the drafts of the bill and all this. So it, I think it's important to keep ourselves educated about what's happening, what's what what's the government doing. I mean, you will if you this. RUSA is also available. The, that do document is also available. Uh, I mean, one should actually. I mean, people who are like you know have that kind of mind. It's one thing is about yeah uh, doing protests on street and all that, but it's also important to see what kind of you know uh, policy changes are being made and so on and uh, intervene there. Quite often, the ministries also write. Uh, they make public uh, uh, what do you call bring out public appeals to asking for uh, feedback on these kinds of things. I remember when the EFL University Act was being made, some of us, uh, I can't see people who were there at that time, we wrote to the mi uh, ministry saying that, no, no, we want these provisions and, uh, you know, when the bill is being. So I think these, uh, so uh, let us hope that, I mean, I'm sure uh, Professor Anil Gop Sadgobal's talk will also inspire uh, people to think about this and also make the demand for uh, this democrat democratizing education and resisting the kind of uh, movement. So when we say, because quite often some people say that, uh, why are we bothered about preserving public universities? They are anyway, you know, uh, like Agraharas. Uh, all Brahmins sit there uh, as professors and, uh, you know, why should we be bothered about them, let them die? But then I think, uh, I don't know whether that's the right kind of attitude because it, if you look at it, it is now that you are, you'll find that the, the kind of characteristic of these universities are changing. And this is the right time, I think, to kind of, you know, make that change happen and uh, see that um, education, after all, fulfills something of the kind of social, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, equalizing, equalizer that it was supposed to be, it's supposed to be. So I think I'll uh, stop there uh, and uh, maybe if there are questions or points for discussion, I'll take that. Uh, other speakers come or? Uh,